Welcome back, everyone. We are nearing the end of our journey this semester, and today we're going to continue. We finished up last time with fishes. Uh, and in case, just I should have told you this, just in case you're not familiar with this convention. So I say fish and fishes. Many of you probably already know this, but I didn't know this until I went to college. Um, so when I say fish is plural, that means all of those fish are the same species. But when I say fishes is plural, that means they're fish of, well, fishes of various species. So just to make that clear. Um, one other thing I want to make sure I didn't confuse you on, you know, as, as I finished up, I thought, oh no, some of you might be confused because in lab we talk about class osteichthys for the bony fishes. Um, and then I talked in my lecture Sparrows are out. Hopefully the sparrows don't come in. Uh, I've had some issues with sparrows. We have a nest right above our sunroom door, and those sparrows don't have the best names, so I've had several sparrows in the sunroom. Anyway, um, so Osteichthys is a class, and in the last lecture I talked about class Actinopterygii, the ray fin fishes, and Sarcopterygii, which are the low fin fishes, um, from which uh, amphibians and land mammals, oh, everybody, um, have some common ancestor. And those love fin fishes are coelacanths. I just mentioned them in passing. They're actually still extant, coelacanths. Anyway, um, those are sometimes called classes. They're more technically subclasses. So within the bony fishes, the osteichthys, you have actinopterygii and sarcopterygii. Uh, so they're technically subclasses, but you will often see them called classes. So don't let that confuse you. It's osteichthys and then ray fin fishes and low fin fishes within the um, bony fishes, class osteichthys. So if you see them called a class, your book literally calls them a class. They're technically, they're on the class level, but... They're, with, they're all within osteichthys. So you can also think of them as subclasses. Um, the, only thing, the other thing I'll tell you is the teleos is the bony fishes. That is more of a clade. Um, so if you hear folks talk about the teleos, that's just that phylogenetic group of bony fishes. Okay, I just wanted to clear that up because I usually talk about it in the fish lecture and just zoomed right through that. Um, but I wanted to be clear that how that taxonomy plays out. So you're not confused when you're studying for your exam. Um, yeah, so let me know if you have any questions about fishes and we're gonna run today into, getting real fun, uh, amphibians, reptiles, and birds. And we'll see if we get into mammals. If we do, we'll finish early this semester. Who knows, who knows? Okay, so. Let's talk about, this is class amphibia. There are five key features that we'll go over in just a sec, but I want to show you where we're at here. So here we are, This these are the jawless fishes, Agnatha, right? Cartilaginous fishes are chondrichthys, okay? And then um, this is just showing you, so these actually, don't get confused, I'm just showing you where, so these are all osteichthys, but in the phophylogeny, the ray fin fishes evolved, before these, which are actually the, lo the lobe fin fishes, bless you. These are the lobe fin fishes and they're actually divided out into um, the coelacanths and the lung fishes, the dipnoi. You don't have to know that, okay? I'm just giving you that info for your life because I know you really wanted to know in this phylogeny. So lobe fin fishes, they're separated because there's a couple kinds, coelacanths and lung fishes. Oh my gosh, that reminds me of when I was in my master's, uh, yeah, I took an ichthyology class, and I, that was when that whole, like, pants on the ground, pants on the ground, you probably don't remember that, that was, like, 10 years ago, anyway, I had a really great song about coelacanths on the ground, it was really great, okay, anyway, so, now, so, jawless fishes, let me just do this again, cartilaginous fishes, shark skates and rays, bony Fishes, okay, that's really all you need to know. Know the ray fin and the lobe fin, but, okay. Know that 
the further, you know, that common ancestor of all the amphibians and so forth, that is um, a lobe-finned fish creature. creature. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about amphibia. Oh, do you see this? Look at that. Do you see that? Ooh. Towards the end. All right, so amphibia. Which animals are amphibians? Now we're actually with, like, I know most folks know what a fish is, but um, now we're really with the organisms that you see pretty often because you live on land. So, um, we have the frogs. So the frogs in and the toads are grouped together, but if you have the frogs, they have the, uh, how do you say, the smooth skin. They have smooth skin and it's usually pretty moist. Very moist. That's how you remember frogs versus toads. Toads tend to have um, bumpy skin and they tend to be drier. And really the main division between a frog and a toad, besides those characteristics, it really has to do with, oh, my tiny. It has to do with um, how adapted they are to live in a drier environment. Toads tend to be more terrestrial adapted than frogs. Okay, so in case you were wondering. Um, also, frog toads won't give you warts, really. So that's actually an old wives' tale. Or whoever. So you got these guys, frog, toad. Okay, then you got, they're actually in a group together. We'll talk about that. You have the Sallymanders. No buddy, no buddy. And then you have Sicilians, which um, looks look like snakes, but they're not. They're actually um, amphibians. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. So what are the key innovations that appeared in amphibians? So this move from aquatic environments to terrestrial environments was a huge jump. And so these are some of the ways that these organisms are able to accomplish that. First, of course, legs. Legs. So important that a mermaid was willing to sell her voice and basically risk her life to uh, get some legs. Actually, she did that for a man. Ooh, that was really... Why'd you do that? It's not a good idea. Anyway. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, legs. Yes. So those are really important, right? You can't be up where people are. I'm so sorry. I promise to stop making Little Mermaid references if if you don't have legs, right? So you had those lobe finned fishes. They have that fleshy part of that the, the lobe in their fin, and then the ray part that over time adapted and became those early appendages. Okay, legs. So second key innovation was lungs. Now, amphibians don't just require rely on lungs for respiration. Um, they, but they do use those lungs. Their lungs don't have as much um, surface area, and that's why they rely on the next thing I'm going to talk about, but they do have lungs, and that was a big deal. Okay. Cutaneous respiration. Now, this supplements the lungs. This is why it's important for frogs to um, and toads to have all the surface area, um, and that's also why, like chytridio mycosis, uh, the chytrid fungus that can hurt frogs, it grows on them, so they can't respire through their skin. That's actually one of the ways that it kills them. So cutaneous respiration is really important in frogs and toads and other well and other amphibians because it supplements the lungs because their lungs are not quite like our lungs. They just don't have as much surface area. So they rely on cutaneous respiration, which is, oh, just to be sure you know, which is gas exchange over the skin's surface. That's what cutaneous means, over the skin surface. Okay. All right. Other key innovations, because there are five, uh, pulmonary veins. Okay. So this is where you have a um, basically the, the blood, um, the pulmonary blood circuit is pushing stuff into the tissues at a higher pressure. So you have this pulmonary vein um, where, well, it's not pushing because that's what an artery does, but it basically allows for um, your blood to, to get to tissues more efficiently. 
Okay, so that pulmonary vein helped blood get to tissues more efficiently. All right. Um, and this, the three-chambered heart, was also a, an innovation. So they have a partially divided heart. They have two atria, but one ventricle. Okay, this is an important thing to remember about amphibians, because if I ask you, you know, what animal, you know, has, uh, you know, vertebrate has a three-chambered heart? That's an amphibian, dog. Okay, so you have the atria and the ventricle down here that basically uh, improved circulation because you don't have, you know, you don't have as much mixing of your systemic blood and your pulmonary blood, which is, you know, um, oxygen poor and oxygen rich blood. Okay, so that partially divided heart, super important. So why were these important? Well, I'll tell you why. So when you move on to land, you may have noticed if you've been swimming for a long time, there are some differences, right? You're pruning now. Um, so first of all, those legs had to support the weight of the animal, which was a big jump because up to that point, you were immersed in an aquatic matrix. Those lungs assisted in extracting oxygen from the air. And the thing is, like, gills, so it's actually harder to extract um, physiologically. It's more difficult to extract oxygen from water. However, so gills are, like, great, right? The problem is, here's the issue. Gills are so, um, they're so... I can't think of the word I'm trying to tell you. Gills are very delicate. They're so delicate that essentially being out in the air with gravity, without this aquatic matrix, it collapses them essentially. So they actually can't extract oxygen from the air. They're unable to function correctly in air. Okay, so lungs were very necessary for this. All right. Um, that heart, so the partially divided heart, okay, and those pulmonary veins. So partially divided heart, pulmonary veins, were super important that allowed for the evolution of larger muscles and specifically jumping muscles and crawling muscles, okay? Also, um, things that you need to know about them, actually, you, uh, they actually still do, they uh, undergo external, fertilization, and we'll mention this again and again to help you remember, but they also still reproduce. They go back to water to reproduce to prevent their egg from drying out because these have not yet, we still haven't gotten to organisms that have watertight eggs. Okay, so amphibians rely on water. They still reproduce in water. All right, cool. And they also have a system to, present, to prevent whole body desiccation. So though they, many of them still um, you will find near water bodies because they have to stay moist for that cutaneous respiration. So this is just showing you. And your book talks a little bit about the various organisms like um, tiktolic, which is an intermediate form that provided evidence um, for early amphibians and that kind of linkage in the evolutionary trail. Um, and actually there was a, an organism before tiktolic, ichthyostega, that is a, an intermediate form that we found between the lobe fin fishes and early amphibian fossils, where you actually are seeing you have the bones of the lobe and developing, well, this is the pelvis, and here's the shoulder, right? And if you look specifically at the shoulder, the tiktolic, you have changes occurring, right, from here to here to here, where you development of those forearm or four limb is what I should say, four limb bones. Okay. So development of those four limb bones that we actually have evolutionary, we have fossil evidence of organisms moving from organisms evolving over time, millions of years from lobe finned fishes to this intermediate form tiktolic to early amphibians. Okay, cool. 
So let's talk about the different kinds of amphibians. We have, there's three orders. Um, and you're almost certainly familiar with the first two. You may be somewhat familiar with the last one, but most people are, it's new to them. Let's talk about the endurance. So order Anura, so we have kingdom element animalia, right? Phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, class amphibia, order Anura. Anura are the frogs and toads. Frog and toad, endurance. So if you've ever read a paper um, maybe you probably haven't yet, but a lot of folks, when they first start reading papers about ecology and they hear pe people write about anurans and they're like, well, what is that? It's, it's, it's frogs and toads. So, um, great. So frogs, as I said before, have smooth skin, moist skin, and they have much longer legs than toads for jumping. Okay, cool. And here... Ooh. Showing you froggy. All right, here's the thing. Frogs actually, so they have, require water for reproduction and that larval stage. You are all probably familiar with this. You've probably seen a tadpole, but a tadpole is a larval stage. They still have that postnatal tail. Um, oh, yeah, I should mention a neurons. These are the only amphibians without tails, um, but they do have a postnatal tail in development as larvae. And then they metamorphose into adults over time. Okay. Whereas then you have toads, again, bumpy dry skin, more adapted to dry environments. And these organisms have shorter legs. So when you see a, a, um, a neuron, frog or a toad, and you're not sure, ask yourself, is it super bumpy? Is it dry? You can pet it. It won't, it won't bother you. It might be like, oh, please don't eat me. But if you're in a dry environment, though, it's most likely that what you're looking at is a toad. We have a pretty good share of frogs and toads around Arkansas, lots of toads. Um, but also one thing to keep in mind, toads themselves are actually not a monophyletic group because you have different lineages, disparate lineages that have evolved to exploit niches in desert environments, upland environments, and mount mountainous environments, or montane. That's another word for mountain environments. Hey, look at that. So here you have a lovely, 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 yep, it's a toady. Big old toad. Let's look at him. I forgot that that was in there. <laughs> All right, so still remember you have and a requirement of water for these organisms. So they go back to the water to lay their eggs, and these are not watertight eggs, right? With they have external fertilization. So what will happen is um, you all are probably aware of this. In the summertime, in springtime, you hear frogs calling, right? They're calling for a mate. But that that external that fertilization does not actually take place internally in the female. The um, it is external, and typically where you'll find it is in near a water body. You'll find it in like little pools or puddles around around the actual main channel because you don't want to lay your eggs in a fast flowing or swift flowing system, right? Or swift flowing location. My dog is like definitely not trying to alert me to something. What's up? Okay. Um, and also wetlands. Wetlands are, wetlands are very important and very highly utilized by amphibious organisms, and particularly anurans for reproduction. That's actually one of the reasons that it's so important to preserve wetlands, because there are certain certain kinds of frogs and toads. Um, I'm thinking of the crawfish frog that really needs these wet habitats, and they're becoming more and more sparse. So. If you're interested in conservation, um, amphibian conservation is actually a big thing because of the multiple stressor situation of um, human anthropogenic, that's human caused anthropogenic, alteration of the landscape, uh, the destruction of aquatic or amphibious habitats, aquatic, semi-aquatic habitats, wetlands, um, and well, climate change, okay, that's another one. 
and emerging diseases um, and pathogens. For example, chytrid, chytrid fungus that we've talked about before that kills frogs. All right, so external fertilization in water. And like I said, you've got that tadpole with the postanal tail, and as it grows into what we call a metamorph, it will grow its legs, and it's so cute, and it becomes a little frog. It's so cute. I should have brought a frog. Anyway, so this is just showing you a life cycle. So if you've ever seen, you've probably seen frog eggs and didn't know what you were looking at. Um, well, not necessarily just frog eggs. You've probably seen a neuron or, um, or some sort of amphibian eggs and didn't know that's what you were looking at. They're basically like long strings. Let's see if I have, nope. Long strings of um, little black pearls, essentially. What's wrong, Kiki? What's wrong? So here you have the egg, and as they hatch, you have the tadpole that will develop here. Okay. And basically, the tadpoles stay in a, one small space. You'll often find tadpoles, again, just like with the eggs, not too terribly far from where the eggs were laid, and uh, in fairly... I'm sorry, I'm like super distracted trying to do this family. Um, you'll understand, I think. So fairly um, serene environment. So little pools off of the main channel or things like that. Ziggy, what is wrong? Am I not giving you enough attention? Come here. You want to teach about froggy? No froggy. I would accidentally eat a frog trying to be friends with it. Yes, I would. I would really try that. I wouldn't try to kill it. I just wouldn't try to it. And then accidentally kill it. Okay. Talking to Morty. Morty's not going to W-A-O-K you. I can't say the word because she loses her mind. Okay. Right. Anyway, so tadpole will grow into a metamorph where you have the beginning of the limbs. And you don't have to know these stages. Just be sure you know that a tadpole is a larval frog. You probably knew that already. Okay. And of course, remember that external fertilization that requires water. When you don't have watertight eggs yet, that's important to remember. All right, so let's talk about the next order, which are the caudates, caudata. Those are the salamanders. They're adorable. Okay, large range of sizes. You have really teeny weeny salamanders and large salamanders. They exploit a wide range of habitats. You have some salamanders that are mostly actually aquatic. Uh, and some salamanders that are primarily, you know, terrestrial. They still utilize, they live in moist areas, but they're primarily terrestrial. And most of you have probably seen a salamander, but if you haven't, you know, it's a longer amphibian. This is showing you one aquatic, primarily aquatic salamander. But here, see it's that longer body and a tail. Okay. Oftentimes when people hear things like Shh, in the leaves, they're like, Shh. it's usually either a salamander, which is an amphibian or a skink or, or some sort of reptile. Anyway, um, explain a bunch of habitats. These organisms, as opposed to the anurans, the frogs and toads, caudates have practiced internal fertilization. And what happens is the female essentially stations herself over a sperm packet. And allows for fertilization to take place. These also differ from the anurans in that the larvae are not like, they're not tadpoles that go through a metamorphosis. The larvae are basically like small adults. They're just little baby adults. They do have um, tails, um, but they are more similar to the adults than the tadpole of an anuran. Okay, so here you have the egg mass and water. So here's an egg mass from salamanders. You may have seen this and not realized that. So it's kind of like jelly-like stuff with black stuff in the middle. And for anurin eggs are similar to this, except they're like long strings. So have you ever seen a long string of black stuff like that? Those were frog eggs or toad eggs. Well, yeah, anurin eggs. So here's a salamander egg mass that's been laid in water. And as they develop, you have the hatching of the larva, okay? And you may notice it kind of does, it looks a little bit like a 
um, like a, a tadpole, but it's not a, it's not an actual tadpole. We don't call them tadpoles. All right, we actually call these. A lot of folks will call them mud puppies. I call them larval salamanders. Anyway, so you have the development of you have your gills, and I will also say you'll lose the gills in some of the salamanders. There are actually salamanders that like sirens. Um, if you don't know what a siren is, you can look it up. They they have gills throughout their lives because they're actually primarily aquatic. They are aquatic. So terrestrial adult there is longer. So you have the egg and then, but is it? It's not a true, um, it's not a true metamorphosis like the frogs with their metamorphosis. Okay, they're more similar to the adults here because you have this long body and they res they reserve that post anal tail. Um, oh, yes, if conditions are unfavorable on land, they can't actually stay in the water and still reproduce. And that, like I said, you still you also do have you have some salamanders that are just primarily aquatic. OK, but most of them are amphibious. So the apods, apoda of the Sicilians, many, many people uh, mistake these for snakes, but they are not reptiles. They are amphibians and you find them apoda. This order basically means no legs, because they don't have any. What do you want? They don't have legs, okay? Ooh, okay, so these are tropical burrowing amphibians. Here you have a very happy person with their Sicilian, and they feed on invertebrates, worms, um, and practice internal fertilization. So one way to remember this is at neurons, you have ex external fertilization, uh, caudates, the salamanders, you have internal fertilization where the female goes and sits over an egg packet. Here you have actually true internal fertilization, right? And these organisms, like I said, often mistaken for snakes because um, they don't have legs and they have, they almost look like they don't have eyes, but they do. They're just really, really small. Um, you are unlikely to run into a Sicilian around here because they're a tropical animal. But if you've ever been to um, a tropical area, you may or may not have run into these. A lot of folks are very unfamiliar with these, but those are the third order of amphibians. All right, that's amphibians. That's it. Three orders. Remember them. Remember your frogs and your toads and your salamanders and your Sicilians. And you'll be good. All right. And also be sure that you know the, the five characteristics of an amphibian. All right. Great. Let's talk about reptiles. So you have over 10,000 living species of reptiles. Most of those are um, most of those are lizards. Uh, of sizable minority are snakes. Almost all of them. Let me just say this. Almost all of them, the vast majority of them, are non-venomous. Okay. There's only two reptiles that I can think of: the Gila monster, um, and there's one more. Um, the oh, it's a Mexican the collared lizard, that are venomous. And there are more species of snakes, but it's not the majority. Most snakes are non-venomous. Um, and also, let me just make a distinction here. If something injects its venom into you, it's venomous, not poisonous. Poisonous, you must ingest. Now, if you eat a snake and it makes you sick, which is unlikely, um, that would be poisonous, but they're not. They're venomous. Not all of them. Okay, sorry. I always get into that. So, reptiles. Key features of reptiles. And the reptiles here, these are just clades. Um, we're, the colonia, which are the turtles and tortoises. Uh, Lepidosauria is actually the, uh, you don't know this yet, the squamates, the lizards, snakes, and tartaras, and then the crocodiles and alligators. Okay, so this is actually a grouping of Two, two um, classifications we're going to talk about. So you have all of these. Notice how closely related the crocodilia are to the aves, which are the birds. Okay, so let's talk about the three key features of reptiles. All right, first is the water tight egg. So reptilia, aves, and mammalia, those classes, we are called amniotes because we have amniotic eggs. Reptiles, birds, mammals, amniotes, watertight eggs with multiple 
layers that each has a an important characteristic and important function okay so the amniotic egg this was a really huge innovation that helped with this colonization of land because you didn't have to go out and seek water now you had this amniotic egg and you could just lay your eggs right so let's talk about the four membranes and the four parts of the amniotic egg and what it does so here here you have the you're looking you're looking into the egg okay into the egg so this outermost layer here is the chorion all right the chorion functions for gas exchange right also uh prevents desiccation to some extent so if you have an egg that does not have the chorion listen to my words if you have an egg that is missing a chorion, that embryo will suffocate and dehydrate because you can't have gas exchange and that chorion is again functioning, partially making, part of it is making that egg watertight. It's preventing desiccation, All right? So gas exchange and preventing desiccation. So if you don't have a chorion, suffocation, All right? The amnion is here, and the amnion is what is encasing the embryo in a fluid-filled cavity. In a mammal, when you think of like a pregnant woman who does not lay eggs, but um, you have an amnion, right? So, um, but there are egg like, like mammals. So, but even in the mammal, that the mammals that are not egg-laying, like who have true internal, like we carry our babies like we do, you still have these, um, these membranes, okay? So you have your amnion, which in, like I said, in a mammal like us, you think of as the water, right? We call it the amniotic sac, that's the amnion. So it keeps the embryo, um, essentially it encases it and protects it for the duration of gestation, okay? Next, you have the yolk sac. The yolk, of course, is more, very important because it provides food for the organism, be a developing embryo. You've probably uh, enjoyed many a yolk, yolk sac downs. Yolk. Actually, fun fact. So, you know, yolks, um, they, they, you are usually not eating an actual, like, the, you fertilized egg. Um, in fact, you're almost, you're never doing that unless you're buying it from, just a fun fact, I know some people worry about this, um, you know, it's an egg, it's basically, for the most part, like I said, I've told you, it's like a chicken menstruation, it's kind of like that, it's like, um, the egg, if it's unfertilized, you still have, and I'm talking about particularly, like, with, eh, with, like, avians, but that yolk, um, sac unless you have a rooster around you don't have a fertilized egg now i will say actually if you live on a farm and there's a rooster that can fertilize the eggs you may have eaten a fertilized egg you'll actually see a tiny embryo um but you never have that if you buy your eggs at the store not directly from a farmer and anyway okay i'm getting off here sorry i get excited about stuff like that okay so yolk sac provides food and then you have the allantois, which is here, the allantois is important for um, waste excretion from the embryo. All right, so chorion is gas exchange, prevents desiccation. Amnion is protection for the embryo, okay, as it's jostled around in there. Um, the yolk sac is the food for the embryo, and the allantois is essentially the excretory system for the developing embryo, all right? All right, so be sure you know those parts of the egg. Now, that is one of the key features of reptiles, that amniotic watertight egg. They're amniotes, just like mammals and avians. Reptiles also have dry skin, typically in scales, which covers the body and prevents water loss. And then the third key innovation is thoracic breathing. So, it's loud, I'm dog. so, Thoracic breathing is a little is an innovation because you actually don't have thoracic breathing, true thoracic breathing in amphibians. So amphibians, even though they have lungs, 
They will open their mouths and essentially gulp air and use their pharynx to force air into the lungs. So in an amphibian, even though they have lungs, their capacity to take in oxygen from the air is limited by essentially their gait or their the size of their mouth because they're gulping air. They're going and then they're pushing it down with their pharynx into the lungs. That is not the case in reptiles, and this was a key innovation. This was true thoracic breathing where they use the diaphragm to take in air, and that increases the lung capacity because then you're not limited or increases the capacity to take in air because um, I should I should call that call that air intake capacity because you're not then limited by essentially what you can put into your mouth. You're only limited by the size of your lungs, okay? And your lungs have um, more, more capacity than your mouth, higher capacity to take in air. So that was a key innovation, that thoracic breathing, which you do, okay? Whereas the amphibians, they're gulping air. All right. So ex let's talk about some extinct reptiles. Um, so extinct reptiles, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about them, I guess, just for a second. So I told you before that dinosaurs were the dominant um, organisms on Earth for millions of years, right, over 150 million years. And then you have a mass extinction event 65 million years ago. Um, show my dreams now. Dreams now, dinosaurs, except birds. Birds. Um, birds are, we you know, are the descendants of dinosaurs. So the crocodilia are um, related but not direct, um, which is basically like birds. So dinosaurs went extinct, but they themselves are large reptiles. Okay, and that was that asteroid impact 65 million years ago. So let's talk about the characteristics of modern reptiles. Modern reptiles practice, so you have internal fertilization. So the sperm fertilizes the egg, and then those protective membranes are formed. And the egg is laid, right? That's important because the amphibians, you have multiple modes of fertilization, or you have some external and some internal. Here, all reptiles, internal fertilization. You also had improved circulation because um, since you, you don't have cutaneous res respiration in the reptiles, so you have to provide oxygen to the body more, um, more efficiently. So you have the heart is still, you still have some mixing, but that, that wall is larger. So basically the heart, the division, the division of the heart is larger in reptiles versus amphibians, which only have that partially divided heart, okay? Cool. You still have that pulmonary and systemic circuit, though, um, which was a huge innovation for that land invasion from the amphibians. Reptiles are ectoderms. That means that their body temperature matches the outside world around them. Um, and we'll talk, once you get to ecology, many of you will take ecology, we'll talk about the, the difference between an ectoderm um, and an endoderm, and um, that's not right. Hold on. Yeah, ectotherm. They're ectothermic. Um, so ectoderms and endoderms. That doesn't seem right. Hold on, guys. This is like a skin layer. This is a germ layer. Yeah. Um, I should say ectotherm. I'm sorry. Look. Let's just say ectotherm. Okay. So, ectotherm. Sorry, I was like, this is wrong. So, um, just so we're clear, I was like, I had to check myself. I was like, am I crazy? Did I not get a PhD in biology? Okay. So, Ectotherms are <laughs> their body temperature matches the outside. Not ectoderms. Ectoderms, so you have endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Those are germ layers. 
Biologists actually do this all the time. Uh, this is like the 50th time I do, I've done this, probably this year. Um, so an ectotherm, you have their, their body temperature matches the outside. And now I'm seeing that you can't really see all of this. I'm sorry about that. Let me move the shape of this window. You can see, there we go. Hope it's not been that way the whole time. So, and these are the ways that they actually um, will, will regulate their body temperature. Ectoderm, ectotherm. Okay, if you see derm, that means, you know, skin layer basically. So, it, an ect, the ectoderm is the outermost germ layer in an embryo. Ectotherm is an organism that regulates its body temperature using the outside. Typically, it's a behavioral, a, a series of behavioral mechanisms since they're what you think of as cold, cold, cold blooded. And if you get to ecology, we'll talk about the difference between an ectotherm and a, um, a poikilotherm. They're highly synonymous, but there are some key differences. Um, and we think of those as cold-blooded animals. So the ectotherms, cold-blooded animals, utilize things like they sun themselves so that they can take advantage of radiative heat and evaporation, evaporative cooling. You also will have them sitting on hot rocks. That's for conductive heating. Um, and also sit, sitting out in the sun, and they'll actually change their body angle where they are to regulate that body temperature. Four orders of modern reptiles. We have Colonia, which are the turtles and the tortoises. This is getting increasingly hard to teach in my house. Um, the the Rhynchocephalia, which are the um, Tauteras. Squam squamates, which are lizards and snakes. And Crocodilia, which are the crocodiles and alligators. There are only two species of alligators in the world now. And you find these everywhere. So let's move through this. I want to get through reptiles and birds today. Um, and then we will, once we get through reptiles and birds, we'll just be in mammals. And I'm hoping, hopefully, if I can get through this in the next 10 minutes, we can finish on Wednesday. All right. So squamates. Squamates are the reptiles and uh, reptiles and snakes. Please don't do that right now. Oh, we're just trying to finish the semester. So, squamates are the lizards and snakes. All right. Important things to remember. If they do have limbs, like the lizards, so saria are specifically the lizards. You don't have to know that. I'm just breaking them out for you. Um, their limbs are all at right angles. And they can regenerate their tails. Lizards are almost primarily almost all terrestrial, and there are 6,200 species. So the vast majority, not vast, the majority of squamates are lizards. I don't know what I'm looking at, but I am really trying to teach right now. You need to use a, what is that called? Oh, please don't lay on the couch with all that dog hair. Okay. Sorry, guys. Just skip forward if you need to. All right. So the serpents, um, snakes, serpentes, these are the legless lizards, and they have unhingeable jaws. They can unhinge their jaws so that they can take in larger prey, which is really important when you don't have limbs, right? Yes, they have movable eyelids, external ears, something that many people don't know. Snakes actually have external ears. Adorable. Most of these are terrestrial, though you do have some that are aquatic um, and marine. And they're, like I said, sizable minority of the squamates are snakes, most of which are non-venomous and don't want anything to do with you. I know some of you are like, whoa, but snakes. And here's a really cool thing. Uh, leglessness is not quite as, as deleterious or detrimental as you might think because, and we know that because leglessness has evolved like, oh, Many times. Leglessness has evolved many times in the um, reptile lineage. All right, so squamates, reptiles, and snakes. Rhynchocephalia are the Tauteras. Tauteras are, um, they are, um, 
basically you only find them in New Zealand. And, I, and I've always said this differently than most people do, so if you've heard it a different way, that's right too. This is how I learned it. And I just stuck with it, okay? So these organisms, um, you only really find them in New Zealand. And they're a lizard-like, right? They're their own order. They're a lizard-like organism. One cool thing about them, though, is they have this parietal eye. So it's a, basically it's an eye under a, a layer of scales. And it's thought that this is really helpful. Um, and it's, I mean, like it's a functional eye, but it's not really good at um, images, imaging. It does have a retina. But the primary function of this is thought to be keeping the reptile from um, ex overexposure to UV light. So it essentially tells the reptile if it's in a spot that's going to potentially make it too hot. And those are the only organisms in that order. Okay, Funkosphalia. Colonia. These are the turtles and the tortoises. So cute. So look at the little giant buddies. They live a long time. Here you have, oh, there you have sea turtles. They're adorable. All right, so they have their shell. They cannot live without their shell. You have the top part, which is called the carapace, and the bottom part is called the plastron. All right, the horny, you have a horny beak, and um, turn to, so, they lay their eggs essentially near near water, okay? 340 species of these. And all you really need to know are these are turtles and tortoises. And I would like for you to know that the back is the carapace and the front is their plastron, okay? For the most part, at this point in the semester, we're just like doing a survey of animals and you really just need to know like the key characteristics, okay? And, and then you'll be fine. So, crocodiles, well, and alligators, crocodilians, include, um, like I said, crocodiles, there's two species of alligators. One of them is the um, American alligator, which you actually have in southern Arkansas. If you've ever been in the wetlands of southern Arkansas, you may or may not have seen an American alligator. Mississippians, this is the species for that one. Um, you also have, well, caimans, they're smaller crocodilians, and ga gavials. So, this is showing you each one of those. Okay. Um, obviously, the difference between an alligator as you see them later and a crocodile as you see them after a while. No, I'm just joking. Um, just kidding. I'm just joking. It actually has to do with a few things. Um, they are different in their um, niche exploitation, their habitat. So, crocodiles live in the tropics, alligators live in the southern United States and China. That's where those two species are found. Um, and you do have differences in the configuration of the teeth that you can see. Okay, so here in the crocodile, generally the way I do it, which is not very scientific, is like, does it look really scary? It's a crocodile. But um, there are key differences in the way that the teeth, the, the way you can see their teeth when you're looking at them with their mouth closed, is you can see both sets of teeth in the crocodile. Okay, whereas you typically only see one set of teeth in the alligator. Um, and these organisms are super strong, super good hunters. Like they lie in wait and they'll come up close to their prey and then just nab it. Um, you may have seen perhaps a crocodile um, nab like a gazelle that has come to the water to drink. That is one of the key characteristics of the crocodilians, is they're excellent hunters. Um, interestingly, the crocodilians are most closely phylogenetically related to the avians, which are the birds. Um, so, and one of the ways we know that the, crocodile, the crocodilians are more closely related to the birds is actually a behavioral thing. Crocodiles build nests, just like birds, uh, and provide some level of parental care. The um, dinosaurs, though, I think I've told you before, also provided parental care. So that's a key thing of the crocodilians is that pro provision for the young, which is very similar to the avians. 
Uh, you also have here, you have uh, even more development of the circulatory system, which is more like the, the avians. Um, so most reptiles have this circulatory system um, where, and th so the crocodilians, their circulatory system is more like the avians and ours, okay? So you have the heart here, right, with the one ventricle that's partially divided, right, partially divided heart. Um, two atria, and then partially divided ventricle, and especially like the reptiles, right? In the amphibians, you don't have that division so much of the ventricle, but in the reptiles, that septum is starting to elongate. By the time you get to the crocodilian lineage, you have true division, okay? So you have two atria and two ventricles. That's an important thing to remember because having two atria and two ventricles, a four-chambered heart, is a hallmark of the avians, but also the crocodilians. It's one of the key innovations for the crocodilians. All right. And now I'm at 50 minutes and I really wanted to get through birds. Mm, that's okay. So um, we're going to finish with birds on Wednesday and move into mammals. And I'm going to do my level best to finish on Wednesday. But I can't make any promises just because of the material that we have. Um, but... In your, I'm going to go in and fix the slides as well. If you've already downloaded the slides, no big deal. But I'm going to go fix those because that is an is a a typo, big typo, ectotherms. Sorry, and I'm sorry that I had to stop for a minute. I was like, ectoderm. That's not right. That that can't be right. Ectotherm. See, even we make mistakes. Actually, I need to tell Dr. Jones because we share these. We have, so, um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions, though. The main points that I need to drive home to you are this. Um, when you're studying, don't get overwhelmed. Draw out your animals. You know, what are the key characteristics of an amphibian? There are five. Three key characteristics of reptilians. And roughly know the different kinds. It's important, especially in the reptiles, because you have that elongation of the septum of the ventricle and the reptiles versus the amphibians that becomes a true four-chambered heart once you get to the crocodilians. So there are several lines of evidence, right, as to why the crocodilians are more related to the avians. And that is that parental care, um, building of nests, which feeds into parental care, and that true division, that double loop circulation. Okay, so just make sure that you're remembering like the key characteristics and you'll be fine. Okay, that's all I have for today. Let me know if you have questions for the, for lab this week. You don't have lab. You well, I mean, if you technically have a lab final, but but if you're doing phylum posters, you'll be fine. And you know, I suggest you if you want to make flashcards or what have you, it's super helpful to you know, look at a picture of a jellyfish. Make sure, one thing I will say, guys, make sure you know what domain all these organisms are. It's the same one. Oh, oh, fiddlesticks. I just remembered we are also doing our review, right? So we have a review, um, and we will do that. I'll talk about this then too, but make sure you know all their domain. Where if y'all missed the domain? I might quit my job. I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I might move to Bali. I can't. It's coronavirus. Uh anyway. Domain. Kingdom. They're all the same kingdom now. They're all the same. Please know that. <laughs> They're all animals. Okay. And then break it down to the phylum. You got some sponges. You got nidarians, right? You got the, well, peripherous the sponges, cnidarians, right? And just move on from there. And within each of those, make sure you know. All right, is there any further class subclassification I need to know? As you get further on, like once we get closer to um, our lineage, you have more to remember, right? You've got chordates, then you got to remember there's subphylum, right? You've got vertebrata or urochordata, what have you, right? Make sure you know that. I'm going way far into this, but I'm just trying to help you with your studying for your lab final. 
this one should not be too hard for you. It shouldn't be too much. Do be sure that you go back through your slides, though, um, that I made for you. Because, like, when you were doing flatworms, right, there may be some, there will definitely be some um, labels. And I'll say, what are these labels? What are those? You have to type it in. Okay. All right. All right. Again, I'll be quiet now. That was a class period. So let me know if you have questions. That's ectotherms. And hope you have a good day. Bye. Oh, now everybody's quiet. Now everybody's quiet. Now they're quiet.